Centers for Diversity, or, since I could never have just one title for a talk, I always must have two, Stop Doing the Same Thing and Expecting Different Results. Uh, and in fact, if you want to follow along at the slides, which have almost nothing on them, it's really not worth your trouble, uh, I have given you a short link to the Google Slides. So, I suppose the first thing I should do, since you have no reason to particularly know who I am, is to introduce myself a little bit. Um, I am the author of the Quick Python Book 2nd Edition, uh, which is intended to introduce people who already know how to code to Python. Uh, it gets pretty good reviews on Amazon, um, and with any luck, someday there might even be a third edition. Uh, I have worked in organizing PyCons for a number of years. Uh, I was the creator of poster sessions uh, at PyCon US, and just uh, Four weeks ago, I launched the poster session at PyCon UK. Um, also at uh, PyCon, I created the Education Summit at PyCon US, which is now going into its uh, fifth year. And last year and this year, I was one of the organizers of the sprints. We actually did an introduction to sprinting for new sprinters, uh, and that, that seemed to help people get into sprinting. Uh, I'm a member of the Python Software Foundation. Uh, this year I was voted on to the Board of Directors, uh, which has been a very interesting time. Uh, and uh, I'm actually the second vice chair. Uh, I'm also the co-founder of a hack day that we call TransCode. Uh, this is the first hack day in Europe that um, is aimed at um, issues uh, facing the transgender and non-binary gender communities. Uh, and again, at PyCon UK a few weeks ago, it was the first time, to my knowledge, that uh, a, an event featuring the LGBT community uh, was part of an established uh, programming conference. So we were, we were a key part uh, at PyCon UK. That was very exciting. So, I think the next thing I need to do is to address the issue, why do I talk about diversity? Uh, this was a question I asked myself at 3 a.m. this morning, right after I dismissed the idea of running away. Um, and I have to admit that this is not something that is particularly comfortable for me to do, to come to a, a place where perhaps I know very few people, I don't know how I will be received, and then to stand up in front of a group of people and call out my differences. Um, it is also, I have to admit, not pleasant sometimes in doing the research because of the amount of um, hate and resentment that um, these topics sometimes generate online. But I do talk about diversity, and the reason that I talk about diversity, the reason that I will probably continue to talk about diversity uh, as long as people will let me and as long as I can manage it, is that um, nearly three years ago, I officially became diverse. I was not diverse before. Okay, I was seen by the world as uh, an American, middle-aged, white, straight guy. That's just about as default as you can get in the world. Okay, um, on that day, was when I actually decided to stop lying to myself, and I actually, instead, became a transgender woman. I seemed to myself to be the same person inside. The world, however, did not see it that way. Uh, in fact, what I found was that all of a sudden, identifying as a woman, being in the world as a woman, I was the disrespected gender in a way that I think it's really hard to explain. Uh, and of course, being out as a transgender person, I was now publicly a member of arguably one of the most hated and despised groups of people in the world. I mean, yes, you can find others that maybe are despised a little bit more, but you really have to work at it. So, this meant that I faced consequences for this at absolutely every turn. This had ramifications for me in terms of the way that people interacted with me, 
in terms of the way that I access medical care, housing, safety. It impacted the way that I was seen on the job. Uh, it impacted my legal rights. Uh, all of these things, and I will tell you, I was one of the lucky ones. Okay? All of these things that I faced were actually far more survivable, far more manageable than they were for many other people. I mean, I, I still have a good job, I still have a good place to live. All of these things were things that I could manage. And as I say, I was one of the lucky ones, but it touched everything. So, and again, I'm not telling this all as, as a huge sob story to get your sympathy. I'm telling you this. I have seen this diversity issue from both sides. Okay, I cannot pretend to have any magic answers to diversity. I cannot claim to be speaking for all people from underrepresented, from marginalized groups. However, I do know what I've experienced, I know what people I know have experienced, and as I say, I've seen it both as the complete default and as not. Okay? And uh, that, I think, is what drives me uh, to speak on things like this. So, I don't see anybody heading for the exits just yet, so that's a good sign. Um, I'm not intending this to be a lecture. This is very much not meant to be where I stand here and point my finger out at you and say, you're doing this bad, or that group is doing things bad, or whatever. That's not really what I'm after. In fact, I will admit to you that most of the things that I'm talking about are actually things that I have also seen in myself. In other words, when it comes to the issues of, of diversity and including people, this is something where no one is exempt from working on this. No one should have a free pass. Uh, if, in fact, you're from an underrepresented group, from a marginalized group, and, and I would claim that myself, that does not mean that you cannot still do the same thing to other people. It's just a very strong human temptation to do that. We all have to work on these things. Okay, so these, and some of the things that I'm talking to you about now are things that I have seen in myself, things that I still have to watch out for in myself. So, this is my audience participation part of the program. So I, I, I want your opinions here. Um, could, I, could I please, I know it's late in the day, but those of you who are still awake, uh, is diversity a good thing? Okay, I mean, be honest. If you don't think so, don't raise your hand. Okay. Um, how many of you would say that in, in, in your community, in the Python community here, uh, in the Python community in Eastern Europe, however you want to define it, that there is enough diversity. So I can't think we got that done. How many say that we have enough diversity? Enough. Okay, so there are a couple of you. You can go read your email. You're not going to like what I have to say anyhow, I'm sure. Uh, I guess actually I should follow up. How many people would rather we just not talk about this stuff and have it just go away? Well, oh, that's a relief. Um, yes, read your email. Uh, so, the answer that most people will give you is that diversity is a good thing. And in fact, there is a certain amount of research that backs this up. Uh, diverse teams solve problems better. Uh, in fact, the harder the problem is, the better, the, the stronger this effect becomes. Uh, and this goes back to studies that uh, are as old as 1956. In other words, for literally as long as I have been alive, and scanning the room here, I would say that's longer than the vast majority of you have been alive. Uh, this has been established. In fact, the, the initial studies were done with mix of gender, and this has actually been explored fairly well. If you are trying to solve non-trivial problems and you are using a single sex team to do it, you are operating at a disadvantage. It's just what the studies say. Uh, it's also pretty clear that diverse teams are more adaptable, 
or creative. These are powerful advantages. Another thing that we should consider is that in our business, the tech world in general, certainly the Python world uh, in, in, in particular, we have a shortage of talent. We have a shortage of people. Uh, I personally have been involved in building development teams in both Chicago and London. And it is a growing nightmare to try to find good people. Okay? Anyone who chooses uh, to ignore part of the potential pool of people that they can hire from is at a disadvantage. On the contrary, anyone who chooses to go after those talent pools that have been neglected will have an advantage. And this situation, in fact, is only going to get worse. Uh, some estimates suggest that if the talent shortage in the tech sector could get twice as bad as it is now within five years. And finally, I would argue that we have a pretty good deal. Uh, we get to do interesting work, we get to work on interesting problems, and in general, I mean it varies, but in general, we manage to make a pretty decent living doing this. It seems to me, and I would hope it seems that way to you too, that it's not fair, it's not right for us to keep this from certain groups of people just because of who they are. So, from, from you know, the show of hands and everything, most of you at least in some way agree with that. And indeed, many, many companies and many people in the tech world uh, agree with this. And in fact, everybody is saying that they're trying to, to increase diversity. Um, all of the big companies are, Google is, Apple is, everyone is saying that they're working on increasing diversity in tech. And yet, uh, I did this search on google.pl yesterday. Uh, I did a different one for Europython, but I wanted it to be fresh and at least a little bit local, so I actually tried again. I didn't get much different than answer. Uh, this is an image search on the word program. Okay, we get 15 images. All but one of them have some sort of human figure in them. Okay, one of the human figures is a cartoon the little boy wearing the tragic sweater vest. Uh, another one is uh, that weird sort of humanoid with the bubble head, fine, fine, but that still leaves us with 12 images that are people. Okay? They look kind of similar to me. In fact, there seems to be one woman, except we can't even see her face, um, she also is not doing nearly as cool a developer-y stuff as all of the other ones, really. She's only got one monitor. I mean, you pick up on things like this. Uh, but all of the rest of them look very much the same. And, okay, so the guy in the lower, in the middle right has bad hair, but otherwise they are pretty much the same. Okay, this is not to say that Google is some authority in the world, but the fact that these images come up first is due to the fact that Google thinks these are the ones that we want to see first. These are the ones that people have wanted to see first. Or to put it another way, um, Twitter, after they, they launched a diversity program over a year ago, I think it's almost two years ago now, and that this is in the States. Um, and um, at, the, at the end of the first year of their diversity program, they had to admit that they had 49 black engineers. Okay, that's 1.7% of the total. In the US, the black population is more like 10, 11, 12, 13%. So in other words, they had made almost no change. Um, another thing, and again, these are, are, are sort of, I, I have to admit, referring more to things that I've drawn uh, from the UK and the US, uh, partly because that's in English, which I can read, and partly because that's where there have been more studies. Um, but it has been noticed that uh, women are actually leaving the technology sector 
in alarming numbers. And these are not people who just started. These are people who have been in the business for uh, 10 years or more that are starting at the point where they should be moving into senior positions. And instead, they're leaving. And in fact, they're not quitting to have children. They're not quitting for reasons like that. They tend to be staying working but leaving technology. Okay? This is exactly the opposite of what we want to happen. Uh, this also indicates, by the way, that the problem with, with women and other minorities in tech is not just a pipeline problem. Okay, this is something that's conveniently pointed to. Certainly there are issues there, but this is not the only problem. It's not the pipeline. So, before I go any further, um, I also want to emphasize that when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about a number of things. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with the term pipeline problem. Oh, pipeline problem. Okay, that's. Thank you for asking that because I shouldn't be uh, speaking in unknown terms. Um, the the pipeline problem is um, a way of, of referring in, in shorthand to the fact that um, the reason there are no women, particularly in tech, is that there aren't enough people graduating, enough women graduating from, from school, so that basically the problem is the pipeline is empty to begin with. Okay, and, and as I say, this is, and the reason I didn't even think to, to explain myself there is that it, it's so common in many circles to talk about this. And um, as I say, in fact, it, it's, it's partly true, but it's not the whole reason. And, and yes, please, if, if, if I start speaking in unknown terms otherwise, please wave at me so that I can, I can explain myself. Um, so, as I say, diversity has many dimensions. Gender is, is a very common one. It seems to me very sad and very odd that when we talk about gen, uh, diversity, we have to mention gender at all. We're not really talking about a minority group here. We're talking about half the world. So, so this, this, this is one you know, that you would think if we could sort anything out, we should be sorting this one out. Uh, but there are other things as well, other axes as well. Um, so uh, there is age, um, race, ethnicity, uh, economic status, uh, religion, disability, autism, uh, LGBT status. The list can go on and on and on. Uh, and in virtually every one of these aspects, the tech industry is not doing that well. Um, in fact, over the summer, there was a Twitter hashtag that trended uh, that was called Real Diversity Numbers. And you can go look it up if you want. This is just all sorts of people raising questions about uh, diversity in tech along all of these different, uh, different axes. So asking the question of, yes, well, so how many of your autistic employees had to quit it because your office was so noisy and confusing they couldn't manage to do their work? Um, you know, how many older employees do you have? Uh, things like that. And I would be the first to admit that those dimensions vary from place to place. So I'm hoping as I talk about this, um, you, will, you will see that I have clearly um, in, in, in the things, that, the examples that I use, uh, a US and a UK bias. That's because that is what I know. Uh, I also did not try to attempt to adapt that to, to this place because I don't know what they are for here you will know what those things are more likely to be here. And I will say that the Python community has been uh, trying to work on this. I think that uh, the Python community, amongst all of the programming language communities I know, is looked to as the leader for this internationally. Uh, certainly, I know people uh, in, for example, the Ruby communities and the JavaScript communities uh, that have, have told me this. Uh, I also know that the reputation that the Python community has for being an accepting and a safe place 
has made a huge difference to people as they are trying to decide what language they should learn. So this is something that I think we can really be proud of. Certainly, I'm happy about it. I'd say the very fact that I'm standing here in front of you is testimony to how the Python community looks at diversity. But I think I also would have to say that we're not done yet. And um, for this, I, I, I can tell you a story. When I gave this a version of this talk at EuroPython, um, I actually, right after it, ran into one of the PyLadies organizers from London, and she was practically in tears. And you know, I sort of asked her, you know, what, what's wrong? Was this something I said? And whatever. It's like, no, 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 the talk was great. That wasn't it. Uh, she's like, but I just heard people talking about how pointless diversity is, and they were the very people who should have been in the talk but weren't, and I just wonder if we're ever going to get there. So, I don't think that we're anywhere near done yet. And I think, and this is something that, that I do when I'm at tech conferences, I ask myself, who is not here? Okay, again, I don't know your community well enough to say, but perhaps you do. Who is not here? Who is not here just because of who they are? It's something to think about. So in any case, I also, when I was thinking about this, um, sort of had another thought, which is, given who we are, given what we do, we love to optimize things. In fact, I would say in the, in the four or five talks that I've been to here this weekend, I've heard the word optimize many, many, many times. Everybody talks about optimizing. Okay, it's what we do. Uh, I have been writing code now for over 25 years, and there is a long list of things that we have done where we've changed the way that we have done things in order to make them better. So, you know, there's TPT, there's, there's object-oriented programming, there are design patterns, there are all of these things. Um, I think mean, the existence of Python itself is meant to be a way to do things better. But it seems we do not apply the same spirit to the problem of diversity. Why is it so hard to optimize diversity? Or, to ask the question another way, if what we're doing clearly isn't working, why do we keep doing it? And so this led me, in my thinking, to consider the notion of anti-patterns. And now you, you may be familiar with the term anti-patterns. Uh, they are, are, are ways of doing things that have become established, but in fact they are not helpful for what they're supposed to do. Uh, my favorite example comes from a friend of mine who describes Microsoft PowerPoint as an anti-pattern for communication. Okay, everybody uses it, it doesn't help. Uh, so, that's why I started thinking about maybe we have some anti-patterns for diversity. And uh, that was what gave rise to my talk at EuroPython. Uh, since the EuroPython talk, I've gone back and thought about these some more. I sort of reorganized them, uh, rethought them a little bit, and what I think is probably the most significant improvement of all, I've added cartoons. Okay, uh, so I have a bunch of them here. The first one uh, I call See No Evil. Uh, this particular anti-pattern is usually expressed when you hear things like this. I don't see a problem with diversity. Okay, I've had some good friends tell me this. I don't see any sexism at all where I'm at. Okay? Um, the people who tell me that, by the way, are always white males. Think about that. Okay? Or, they can flip it around the other way and say, well, but people like that don't want to code. Women don't want to code. Black people don't want to code. Whoever it is that's not here, they're here because they don't, they're not here because they don't want to be. Okay, I can assure you, 
from having talked with those people, from having seen the response any time those populations get a chance to learn to code, uh, sign-ups for Django Girls, things like that, they want to code. Okay, not everybody in the world wants to do computers, don't get me wrong, but there are many people out there in those groups that are dying for a chance to get into do this. Or this last one, and this is this is a touchy one because this is this is a religious word in, in, in the tech world, honestly. Uh, meritocracy. If you invoke meritocracy, you're saying, okay, so the people who are here are the best people because they're here, because we're a meritocracy. Okay? It is a blind belief that if you're here, you must be good. Because if you weren't here, you were good, you wouldn't be here. Uh, it, it's a circular reasoning. It's again, it's a way of, of saying there isn't really a problem. Okay? Again, the notion of meritocracy has perhaps some interest in it. It's, it's great to have people rewarded when they do good things. But it's a very naive to believe that uh, our systems are so perfect that they absolutely recognize all merit and that's got everything sorted out. Um, I call the next one, surrender first, ask questions later. Okay, this one, oops, went too far. This one basically uh, gets out of the whole question by putting the responsibility somewhere else. We don't have diverse people because the education system isn't doing something right. We're not, we're not getting people into the schools the right way. Or, um, it's again, and, and here's my phrase again, it's a pipeline problem. Or people will say, well, I would love to hire somebody diverse, but there are no diverse candidates. They just aren't out there. I can't do it. All of these are ways of just giving up, of saying, I can't do anything, so I'm not going to worry about it. Okay. Another anti-pattern I call rigging the game. And uh, by this I mean that things end up being set up in such a way that people who are different have a very hard time in succeeding. Uh, I can tell you a personal story here on the notion of double standards. And again, people who haven't experienced this will say, ah, oh, come on, you can't do this, can't be right. But it is. Um, when I was working as a male, my management style was never really questioned. We got things done, and that was the only thing that was ever really discussed. Okay, within months of my starting to work as a woman, and keep in mind, I was pretty much the same person, uh, I started to get feedback that I was too nice and I was not approachable enough. In other words, I wasn't nice enough. Okay, two things here. First of all, my niceness or lack of niceness was never an issue as a male. Suddenly, it was a game I couldn't win as a woman. Um, another thing that goes along with this is uh, a lack of defined processes. That is, what do you do if for some reason the system doesn't work quite right? Big companies have paranoid lawyers, particularly in the U.S. where I work, uh, and they have lots of processes. These processes can drive you nuts. They drive me nuts all the time. They can be a royal pain. However, they do offer some protection. They do offer some means of leveling the playing field. They do actually have to have some objective standards in order for those processes to work. In places where there are no processes, this tends to break down. Uh, I would argue that this is actually one reason why the diversity of open source projects is so low. Okay, and, and if you've looked at diversity, say, uh, in the Linux world and things like that, it is really depressingly low. Uh, it's also a reason why a lot of women get burned out and leave the startup world. Because again, everybody's so busy doing a startup, they don't have processes. Um, and another thing, and this is also kind of a double bind, is that um, if you are one of the of the default group. If you're one of the accepted group, quite often in the business world you'll be given chances to take on projects on the assumption that, yeah, yeah, you'll figure it out, that's fine. You've never done this before, but go ahead and do it. And that opportunity then leads to another opportunity 
and that allows you to build skills so that you advance. Uh, a very common pattern uh, with people who are not in the in group. And again, it's uh, because the numbers are much higher, it's seen a lot with women, particularly is they'll say, well, you've never done that before, so we're going to give the project to somebody else. So in effect, you can't get the experience until you've done the thing for which you need the experience, but you can't get the experience until you've done the thing. Uh, and then, a few years go by, and they tell you, well, you, know, you really haven't done anything, so you're not going to get a promotion. There's no way you can win that. As I say, that leads to people here. This one I call, it's all about who. Uh, and the me, of course, is the person who is already on the inside, wondering, well, how shall I put this? I think the best way to put it is, imagine somebody saying, you know, this diversity stuff would be a lot easier if we were all just like me. Okay? Uh, so, this is things like um, culture fit. I don't know, maybe, maybe this, is, is this a term that, that is familiar here? Culture fit is used in hiring people a lot in the U.S. Uh, it means, in effect, look, all of us ride skateboards and drink beer, so if you want to fit in and be a programmer here, you probably need to ride a skateboard and drink a lot of beer, okay? Um, I'm not crazy about skateboards, beer is fine by me, uh, but still neither of those things should be hiring criteria. Okay, so it's sort of looking for people who like the same things that you like, and considering that is how you're going to hire. That's what we mean by culture fit. Um, similarly, uh, there are people who, um, when, when sort of faced with perhaps modifying what they say, in order to be more considerate of, of people from different groups, will invoke free speech. Okay, I'm not going to stop using that particular slur because, well, free speech, I can say whatever I want. Um, this, uh, usually people like that invoke the, the demon of political correctness here. You're, you're making me be politically correct, I'm going to go with free speech instead. Um, personally, what I see in that particular situation reminds me of a great big guy wearing great big boots who likes to dance and step on people's toes. All right? And when somebody says, ow, that was my toe, they say, how dare you impinge upon my freedom to dance the way that I want to? I mean, do you really want to be that guy? Uh, and then finally, the tendency to leave diversity to other people. Uh, and this shows up in all sorts of ways. You can let the HR department take care of diversity. It's not my problem. Or, you're a woman, why don't you take care of diversity? Or better yet, I just heard this from a friend of mine. Uh, oh, we need to talk to uh, some minority candidates. You're Chinese, go do it. Uh, so things like that. It's just a bad, bad pattern. Uh, and then the last one, it's all in your, it's all in your head. Uh, and by that I'm talking about this is what uh, people tend to hear. And then this is when people tell you something that they've experienced and you immediately tell them, no, you're wrong. You didn't experience that, you didn't feel that. Uh, and this is, has happened to me an amazing amount since I got into this position of being diverse. Where if I say, you know, well, such and such made me feel really uncomfortable, they'll say, oh no, no, it didn't, it didn't at all. Uh, that's just, you know, so and so, just being the way he is. No, no, you're, you're not uncomfortable, it's fine. Uh, in fact, this was a classic moment. Uh, a few weeks ago, I got really frustrated by this, and I made a post on Facebook saying I was really tired of people telling me what I'd experienced and how I should feel. And a friend of mine, posted two paragraphs as a comment telling me what I had really experienced and what I was really feeling. And then he didn't understand why I was upset. Uh, so, I, you know, it, it's, uh, it's something that happens all the time. People will not listen. Um, another thing is ignoring intersectionality. Uh, intersectionality is a, a big word that is invoked a lot. 
Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you are familiar with the term intersectionality? Is this a... Okay, well, this is one I, I was expecting to have to explain, so I'm ready for you here. Okay, intersectionality means that if, say, you're a woman and you experience a certain amount of disadvantage and discrimination, that's one thing. If you happen to be a woman and then, let's say, black, that is more than twice as bad. It multiplies, it adds up. So then, if you are a woman, you're black, you are poor, you don't speak English as a native language, you've now got four strikes against you. And that is enormously harder to deal with than any one of those things, than any two of those things. It, just, it, it multiplies up. That's what the idea is behind intersectionality. In other words, if you're going to try to bring somebody into your community that has a number of those things going on, you really need to be aware that there's a lot going on there. They may need more support. They may need more help. And then finally, and this one is, is something that I think people don't tend to think about very much. Um, many, many years ago, uh, I worked at a very wealthy private school in Dallas, Texas. Uh, and you probably have some stereotypes about what people from Dallas, Texas are like. And they're probably all true. Okay? Um, I mean, I, I, I really did have a conversation with a parent once where he said, Now, I didn't pay my money to send Slaky here to get a seat. You make sure he gets a beat. I was like, I can't do his work for him. What? Uh, so, um, in any case, there, um, this was a very white school. They would bring in poor black children from the other side of Dallas to go to the school. And what they found out very quickly is if they just did that without doing anything else, those kids always failed because being different, being brought into that environment, I mean, you may think you're doing just some wonderful, huge humanitarian gesture. Yes, we're bringing in this person. Uh, without some support, they're all alone. They, they, uh, they know that everybody's looking at them because they're different. Every time something happens, somebody doesn't talk to them, somebody whatever, they immediately suspect that this is what's going on. Uh, it leads to a horrible state of mind. Uh, honestly, a state of mind I've been in myself way too many times. Uh, so, if you want to bring people in and have them actually be a successful member of the group, if you want to actually have diversity be good for the person you're bringing in, as well as for the group that's getting to benefit from that diversity, you need to offer some sort of extra support. We need to take this into consideration. So all of this means, as you knew already, of course, I didn't have to go through all of this to tell you this, uh, diversity is a hard problem. Okay? And not only is diversity, which is just getting people in the door, a hard problem, but true inclusion, that is actually making them be a part of your group, your organization, whatever it is that you're trying to increase the diversity of, is an even harder problem. We all need to be aware of that. There are no easy answers, there are no overnight fixes, as I say, I cannot speak for everybody, but I think I do have a few suggestions. So first of all, if you're, going to, if you're going to try to increase diversity, I would suggest only do it if you mean it. Uh, a sort of token show of doing diversity so that you will tick a box and look okay is probably worse, certainly worse for the people that you're bringing in than if you'd ignored them all together. Uh, secondly, if you do want to bring in different people, you will actually have to go out and get them. Just putting a line on your website saying, oh, by the way, we would love to be diverse, come on in, will not work. Okay? Uh, people will not believe you if that's all you do. Uh, instead, you need to actually ask people, do you know somebody who would be interested? Uh, if you start doing that, you will actually get results. In fact, that was largely what drove PyCon US's huge increase in diversity over the past few years was active outreach. It works. And you should also respect the people that you bring in. 
Okay, again, this is not something where you are the great person in power helping out the poor, miserable thing. You need to respect the people that you're bringing in. You need to ask them what it is they need, and you need to listen to them when they actually tell you. Uh, this alone would save, I think, many, many failed diversity efforts across the world. As I say, you need to provide support because somebody coming in who is completely different is going to be in a very tough position. So you need to have some way to, to offset that. And finally, uh, above all, we need to optimize. We need to think about this and ask ourselves, are we really doing what we think we're doing? Is this really helping or should we try something else? Uh, this is what we do with coding after all. Let's do this with diversity as well. So I think here is the real bad news. Uh, if we want to have different people included, we are probably one way or another going to have to change a few things about what we do. Um, and I know that this has been sort of a gloomy talk, uh, but I think that if we can manage to do that, our communities and everybody will be the better for it. So that's what I've got for you. Pi, 
you might know who that was, uh, but uh, in many cases, it will help. Uh, studies have shown that just the name showing up on uh, resumes and CVs and things like that can have an effect over who gets, gets shown. So um, that's an option. I know EuroPython also uh, saved a few slots just for this purpose of increasing diversity as well. So uh, those, those are all options. I mean, in general, it's not an issue of having bad talks. Uh, it's really a question, if you've got a successful conference, of which good talks you want to take. So, there's things to think about. Thank you, for the talk. Um, so, for uh, Icon US, um, for the program community, um, we, we, right now we have about 30% uh, female speakers, and we have about um, and that's also 30% female attendees, and also about 30% female uh, so input, uh, like talk proposals. Um, so I'm wondering, and that sort of like happened accidentally. Uh, and since you mentioned uh, you know, that you did specific outreach to, for helping speakers uh, with the Hangouts thing, what was the, um, what was the and, and that wasn't specifically for women, or that wasn't specifically for any particular mar not marginalized group, what was the uh, turnout for that? Was that notably more, say, was that you know, more or less diverse than the attendee base, more or less diverse than the speaker base in general, etc. Um, it was, the, the ones that, that I did actually ended up being probably less diverse, but then again, Pi Ladies in London had already done that, sort of that was aimed more at, at that particular group. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to say. It's a good way of getting first time speakers in. And I think that's one thing that you have to think about is how you can get first-time speakers in because there won't be very many experienced people from an underrepresented group. Uh, thank you for the talk. It really helps to see from the other perspective. Uh, but one thing I, I personally have a problem with when trying to convince people to come to a conference or to come to a certain event is that uh, I know there will, that there is a good chance there will be some accident, incident, or they won't be treated perfectly. And I'm asking them, to, to basically put their head on the, on the uh, how do I say, uh, to risk unpleasant uh, and to do the work for my community. Like, I, I mean, uh, it should be we doing the work, not them, right? And that also works in such a way that only a certain personality people will agree to that. Only people who are really strong and, and uh, uh, courageous, basically. And uh, do you know any way around that? Um, well, first of all, I sort of, I, I, I applaud you actually realizing that because I think this is a huge thing to actually be thinking about this. Uh, this is one thing that can make people very, very tired if, if, if they're always expected to go and, and as you say, do the work. Uh, at a certain point, you cannot fix everything for everybody at once. Uh, there will be people who are not comfortable doing that. And I think, really, you have to be okay with people not being able to do that. Uh, it, it's far worse to have them come, have a horrible experience, and then go away and shut down. Uh, but, you know, it may be possible to have at least uh, an event or something that is, is, is meant to be uh, beginner-friendly or something like that. So maybe they can come for part of it and they don't have to do the whole thing. Uh, people are, some people are okay at being courageous for an evening. But if you expect them to be courageous for three days in a row, they just can't do that. It's like, no, it's too hard. So, so in a way, I mean, you, you kind of need to go with people who are willing to put their hand out and, and see if it gets uh, or not. And, and, but still also use that experience then to build up the event and make it better so that the other people will come along.
Yes, uh, uh, I also want to first thank you for, for, for the presentation and uh, to the organizers for inviting you here. And uh, speaking about the workplace, um, I wanted to ask you if uh, you believe in uh, supporting and raising the diversity in a workplace, a like bottom up from the, from the employees towards the management and not the other way around? Um, it's a good question. I think in practical terms, you have to start with the junior level just because of the people who will have experience. Um, however, that can't really work unless there are people in management who are willing to support that. So, if management is actually willing to support the idea of bringing on juniors and actually increasing diversity, then it could work. It's, it, it would be wonderful if you could hire somebody at the top level. And um, uh, two companies ago, I worked for a startup that had uh, a, a, a female CEO, and honestly, that was the best experience that I had. Uh, but that's very hard, that's very rare to, to achieve. The other thing is that in, in, in doing this in a workplace, uh, studies have found that hiring just one woman, one minority, one whatever it is, by themselves tends not to work very well. They get overwhelmed, they sort of sink. So that you need to have two, three, something like that so that they at least have each other to talk to. That's a hard problem. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk again. I've already seen it at Europe Python this year, and that's what I'm trying to refer to now. I mean, at Europe Python, you happen to mention some microaggressions that happen every now and then, and from my perspective, it would be also like probably useful to mention it one more time. That's what I'd like to uh, ask you for because. We saw the double standard thing like, oh, girls suck at math because you suck at math. But it's also sometimes like, whoa, you do well. I've never seen a woman doing it. Like, oh, so I'm good for a girl or I'm good in general or, you know, sometimes people really try to be supporting, but they just probably get it wrong. <laughs> so I would like to ask you to maybe mention some other examples like this. So, how many hours do we have? <laughs> um, no, this is something, and again, microaggression is, is something. It was in my talk, and I took it out because with all of the other things that I wanted to put in, I knew I would sort of go down a rabbit hole and never, never get back out. Uh, microaggressions, um, and, and there are some people that make fun of them. In fact, they wear you down because they're all of these little things where they say, uh, and actually, the example I had wasn't even connected to gender. It was, oh, you speak really good English for an immigrant. Um, you know, things like that. Or, um, you know, uh, gee, you know, you, you, where, where did you learn, if you say to, say, a, a black person, well, where did you learn to code? Uh, as though it was some sort of miraculous thing. Or, um, yeah, in the case of, of with gender or something, I was like, oh, well, you're way too pretty to be a programmer. Okay, this is not a good thing, okay? All of these things are meant to be, uh, at least on the surface, meant to be uh, compliments, but they, in fact, have the opposite effect because they call out the fact that, oh, you're really, it's, it's amazing that that dog can actually walk on its hind legs, isn't it? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so, so there are all of these things where you find you, if it's one of these things that's like, you're really good at, for a girl, yes, that's awful, or, oh, I can't believe you don't know the way that said works. Come on, everybody knows that. Uh, you know, all sorts of weird things like that. Uh, and, and each one of them is very tiny. Uh, but um, my, my simile for this is that it's like being pecked to death by ducks. Okay? Not one of them is going to kill you, but over time, endlessly, endlessly, it wears you down. 
So, so yeah, I mean, it's, and, and like I say, we could, actually, I'm sure we could go around and we could go on for a good hour about these things. You don't want to get a start, trust me. I have time for one last question. Do I see a hand? No. Thank you very much for having me once again.